What's up, everybody? Welcome to this brand new edition of the Pack a Day podcast here on YouTube. I'm your host, Andy Herman. Of course, you can always follow me on Twitter at Andy Herman NFL. Got a few different pieces of information I want to go over today, which I'll all get to in just a moment. But of course, the biggest news of the day was not exactly great news. And that's the fact that Jared Valdir, the Packers' most recent signee, who they just got off of the Indianapolis Colts practice squad, tested positive for COVID-19 and in doing so uh, was placed on the COVID-19 injured list. And if it were just that, if that were all that were to be worried about, maybe not the biggest of deals, right? Yes, it's a bummer. You just signed this guy. You're excited that he's an added piece to your roster and that the depth is there and so on and so forth. But he basically was on the team for a day. And if you lose him after just being on the team for a day, it's not like you invested this time, effort, and energy and so on and so forth. It's still a bummer, but you can probably live with that outcome. But of course, it's not that simple. You know, this is an infectious disease that was now in the Green Bay Packers locker room and on the practice field. And that's a major issue. And Green Bay, thankfully, dodged the first major bullet here. And it is a major bullet to dodge because if you're familiar with the COVID protocols, which I know a lot of people aren't because you care about the X's and O's and the fantasy football and those side of things, the stuff that's actually fun to talk about, not COVID-19 protocols within an organization, right? But if you're familiar at all with the protocols, you will know that if you had any close contacts, if anyone was deemed a close contact with Jared Valdir in the building at all, period, they are going to be out for five days minimum. So think that through clearly. He tested positive likely on Wednesday. How do we know that? Well, he tested, uh, you know, he tested negative in his protocols going through everything with the Colts through the game and everything like that. And then when he gets to Green Bay, which he got to Green Bay, I believe on Tuesday because he practiced that day, uh, he gets to Green Bay. He has to pass another test in order to go through and continue the protocols in Green Bay and go through and practice with the team and meet with the team and everything like that. So that means on Tuesday, he had a negative test, right? So that means Wednesday had to be the day unless he, he had a later test on Tuesday, but likely Wednesday is when he had a negative test and then they, you know, took him off, you know, you know, didn't have him practice and everything like that. So Wednesday positive test, if he had any, you know, any contact with anyone from that point forward, from that positive test or around him around that time, they're out for five days. And you can do the math quickly in your head. That means that anyone that was in close contact with Jared Valdir from the time that he came to Green Bay, basically, would have been out for this game against the LA Rams. And that is a major bullet to dodge for Green Bay, the fact that they didn't have anyone. And hopefully, hopefully that means that it's less likely that there's actually anyone that's going to test positive as well. First of all, for health issues, right? You don't want anyone uh, to contract this disease. But also, uh, because that would you know make make them out uh, once they test positive. So that would be a major issue as well. So the first big test was passed. And this has been an issue with other teams. The Cleveland Browns had contact tracing issues. We've seen issues with it in the past with the Denver Broncos. That's how they lost their quarterback room. Um, it wasn't that they had a bunch of positive tests. It was that people could have been positive based on contact tracing. So Green Bay passed a major, major hurdle by not having anyone eliminated for Saturday's game because they stayed separate, had masks. They've been using their little... Um, you know, notifiers if they're in, you know, within six feet of someone. So kudos to the Packers and their organization and their doctors and everyone else that's been setting up everything at Lambeau Field to make sure that people aren't coming in close contact with one another because that could have completely derailed the season right then and there. Even if there weren't positive tests, you could have knocked out half the offensive line, right? You, you know, who knows? The, the nightmares are endless based on this. But it's worth noting here that Green Bay is not out of the woods yet in any way, shape, or form. It's possible that somebody still could have contracted the disease. And if so, then it becomes an issue. Then if somebody else tests positive, then you have to do contact tracing through you know that individual. And if somebody else gets it, then contact tracing through that individual. And you can see how quickly something like this can spread throughout an organization, similar to how it happened uh, for the Denver Broncos and the Cleveland Browns and other teams throughout this season. So Green Bay certainly not out of the woods, but they did pass that major hurdle. So where do things go from here? So obviously Green Bay will continue to get tested, their coaches, their players, every, you know, personnel, everything like that through the remainder of this week. 
if there is a positive test, assuming that it's not a false positive. And there is, I believe, an off chance that Valdir could still have a false positive. He would have to have negative tests, I believe, on Thursday and on Friday. If both of those were negative tests and he didn't have any symptoms, I believe at that point he could come back. The likelihood of that is probably not great, but we've seen some false positives so far this season. But let's assume that this isn't a false positive. Let's assume that any subsequent tests are not false positives. If anyone you know tests positive, they're out for 10 days. If you're also doing the math on this, that could potentially, we're getting to the point if they, you know, they had it early enough, we're, it's close, but we're getting to the point that not only would it knock them out for this Saturday's game, but you're getting close to potentially knocking them out for the NFC Championship game as well if somebody did in fact test positive. If you test positive and uh, and, and somebody was a, uh, you know, close contact um, based off of that, you know, positive test, again, that is a five-day period assuming that they don't get the a positive test in and of themselves. And that could potentially put any other player out for the Rams game, but at least back for the NFC Championship. So a long ways to go, but certainly not out of the woods. It was a very, very great sign that everyone was able to practice on Wednesday. It's a very great sign that Green Bay got through that initial contact tracing with nobody else needed to be ruled out. Now you just hope that nobody else tests positive, again, for a variety of reasons, mostly health, but also the game. And we go from here and it's just going to be kind of one of those, you know, bite your fingernails, have nauseousness probably every single day watching the practice report and and all the beat writers that are attending practice to hopefully cross your fingers that nobody was missing from practice on that given day uh, because that's going to be something that's again it's it's going to get you uh, the, you know the pit of your stomach going a little bit because again this is the one thing that we've all known all season long could derail a team at any given time and the Packers have done such a great job throughout the entirety of the season you would hate to see it and oh by the way First of all, before I get to my oh, by the way, for those wondering about Jared Valdir, if he does in fact, uh, you know, go through the process and test negative next week, uh, yeah, test negative uh, next week and no symptoms or anything like that, he, there is a window that he could be back for the NFC Championship game. So if everything goes according to plan and Green Bay wins this week and hopefully there's no other positives and Jared Valdir gets back healthy and he's ready to go next week, he would clear in time for the NFC Championship. And now my, oh, by the way, if there is anyone, and I mean anyone that is out there saying, well, this is karma for the Packers finding a loophole to bring Jared Valdir in after he just played for the Colts last week. This is what you get. Seriously, F you all the way. Because one, this is an infectious disease that is affecting real human beings. So screw that. Number two, Green Bay signed a player off of a practice squad, which has been legal forever. So as long as there's been practice squads and as long as there's been playoffs. So there is no loophole that they took advantage of. If anything, you know, the Colts elevated him from the practice squad to play. It's not that Green Bay did anything illegal or loophole-ish to bring him on the team. If anything, you should applaud creativity and roster building, which is what Brian Gutekinds did. Everything, every protocol was followed along the way. He followed protocols in Indianapolis. He followed protocols when he got to Green Bay. He contracted the virus. It is what it is. There's no karma here. There's nothing that Green Bay did wrong. They did everything perfectly. And unfortunately, it's just the worst luck at the worst time. And this is unfortunately what what can happen in this weird, bizarre year that we're in. So if you're one of those people that's like, that's what Green Bay gets, just screw you. This podcast isn't meant for you. Please unfollow and get the hell out and don't be a dick. All right, a couple other quick notes for today. I've heard a lot of chatter and a lot of talk about Green Bay and their bye week issues. And of course, in the regular season, Green Bay has not had a ton of success coming off of their bye weeks, but I feel like everyone is forgetting the fact that Green Bay had a playoff bye just last year with Matt LaFleur as head coach and Aaron Rodgers and basically almost this entire team that's playing this year. And oh, by the way, I would argue that the 2019 Seahawks are better than the 2020-21 Rams. I would argue that. I would also argue, and I don't think I'm going to get an argument from anyone on this one, that the 2020-21 Packers are much better than the 2019-2020 Packers. So you have a better Packers team this year going against, in my opinion, a worse opponent this year. But uh, in Green Bay, going back to that game, 
Green Bay was up 21 to 3 at halftime against Seattle in that game. There was no bye week blues. There was no issue with them coming out flat. They came out and they handed it to the Seahawks for the first half of that game. Had to hold on as the game went on a little bit, but they completely won that game through and through again against a tougher opponent and again with a worse team last year. So this idea that Green Bay is just going to come out and have all this rust, the Cleveland freaking Browns, right? Last year going or last week going against the Pittsburgh Steelers, they basically didn't even get to practice for the entire week. And they go out and they they execute on all cylinders against the Steelers and put up a crap ton of points. Like they're going to be just fine without having a game a week ago. They're going to be rested. They're going to be fresh. And Matt LaFleur and this offense is going to have a plethora of ideas on how to attack this Rams defense and vice versa with Mike Pettin against Sean McVay's offense. So no bye week blues whatsoever. Not to say it can't happen, but I'm certainly not nervous over it based on what happened against Seattle coming off a bye in the playoffs just one year ago. Last but not least, Daniel Jeremiah brought up a really interesting point and uh, on Twitter. And he basically said, there's going to be all these teams that are fighting over coaches. And a lot of these coaches are going to want to be running this, uh, you know, Kyle Shanahan system that's been so successful throughout the league. And of course, with Green Bay as well. And these new coaches that come in, they're going to be looking for offensive line coaches that can, uh, you know, teach that, the, you know, the zone blocking scheme, the stretch zone blocking scheme that, uh, you know, th- that Kyle Shanahan and the rest of these systems like to run. Um, they're just basically going to want any minds that have been in touch with this type of system so that they can come in and implement it uh, on their new team. And that brings me to three names that I think could potentially be poached off of the Packers roster, and that'll be worth keeping an eye on uh, this offseason. Hopefully that doesn't happen until February, but I still, you know, I can't ever turn that piece of my mind off. So bear with me. Uh, Luke Butkus, I think, is certainly one of those. The Packers assistant offensive line coach. The Packers offensive line has taken a major jump over the last couple of years. And in my opinion, a major jump, even from 2019 to 2020, even though they lost Brian Bulaga and have had injuries to Lane Taylor, David Bakhtiari, Corey Lindsley, yeah, um, Billy Turner, etc. So I think the offensive line has played immeasurably better this year. And I think, you know, Adam Stenovich gets a lot of credit for that. But I think Luke, Butts, uh, Luke Butkus gets, uh, you know, deserves a lot of credit for that as well. And he could easily be a name that gets tossed around as a potential offensive line coach, a full offensive line coach. He's an assistant right now. That would be a promotion. So he could easily be a name uh, that could be you know promoted to one of those positions under a new head coach. Luke Getze, quarterbacks coach, right? I think it would be a jump and maybe I'm wrong here, but I think it would be a jump for him to get full control of an offense as an offensive coordinator with calling the plays and everything. But let's say a Brian Dable, like for, from the Buffalo Bills, maybe a Josh McDaniels, who probably would stay in house in, in one of his Patriots type you know, offensive minds. But let's say one of these offensive minds who are going to call the plays and be a big part of the offense gets a head coaching job. Arthur Smith, right? The Tennessee Titans offensive coordinator would be a phenomenal fit for this. He's going to call the plays. He's mostly going to run the offense, but he still needs an offensive coordinator to do a lot of the things that Nathaniel Hackett is doing for Matt LaFleur in Green Bay. Lou Getze would make a very logical choice to go as an offensive coordinator where maybe he's not calling the plays, but still has a lot of say in the day-to-day operations. Remember, he's not just the quarterback's coach, but he's the passing game coordinator as well. That would be a major loss for Green Bay and potentially a big pickup for a team that's looking for an offensive coordinator, again, that's maybe not calling the plays. And who knows, maybe maybe some team will look at him as a full-fledged offensive coordinator calling the plays. Um, he's a, a, definitely one of the key pieces in this Packers number one rated offense and really revitalizing Aaron Rodgers and getting this offense going. So he could absolutely get a look as an offensive coordinator. And then Justin Outen, um, you know, tight ends coach for Green Bay, who Matt LaFleur praises all the time for the work that he did with the tight ends. You know, you will from time to uh, time to time see tight end coaches move into an offensive line role. Um, that would be, in my opinion, an upgrade if he got full control over an offensive line. You know, going from a tight ends coach to an offensive line coach, a, a team would probably ha- have to add like an assistant head coach title on top of it to, to you know, coerce them over and have it be more of an upgrade. But that could be something. Same thing if somebody was willing to give him like a quarterback coach and a passing game coordinator, something like that. Um, again, he's uh, again he gets a lot of praise from Matt LaFleur. He has an offensive uh, line background, so moving into a full-time offensive line coach position could make a lot of sense. And oh, by the way, was an offensive intern in Atlanta when Kyle Shanahan was there in 2016, and then was an offense, you know, helped the offensive line the two years after that in Atlanta. So 
uh, definitely could be somebody that a team pegs as an offensive line or potentially even a quarterback's coach with maybe an assistant head coach title on top of that to get him to move over. All right, the last thing I want to mention, Dusty Evely just put out a phenomenal article on how Green Bay can attack this Rams defense coming up this weekend. It is on Cheesehead TV. I believe he calls it the Passing Chronicles. Make sure to check it out. Dusty does just a wonderful, phenomenal job, um, and uh, the article is beautifully written. So make sure to check that out. You will learn a lot from it. I know I did as well. So if you haven't yet, make sure to do so. That's going to do it for me. Thanks so much for listening. I'll be right back here tomorrow as always. I know some of you in the comments are saying, oh, what happens when the season's done? I will be here 365 days a year, picking Packer topics, answering questions. We might get into a little bit of, you know, some weird content. I might dabble into some food content now and again. Probably not going to do that, but uh, make sure to subscribe if you haven't, because again, I'm going to be doing this 365 days a year. Make sure to check out uh, Jacob, Jimmy, and Maggie on the audio podcast, but I'm getting out of here. Until next time, and as always, go Pack Go.